Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This one is brought to you by Brilliant. Brilliant is the online platform that presents short courses crafted by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. For example, you go under the category, here's what it looks like. You just have the app on your phone, which I have right there. Brilliant offers short courses in scientific thinking. You know, that's what I do. Classical mechanics, electricity and magnetism, quantum objects, quantum computing, chemical reaction, and computational biology. And if you and your children need a refresher in high school math, Brilliant has it all for you. You can take algebra fundamentals plus algebra one and two, geometry fundamentals plus geometry one and two, and most important of all, I think, probabilities and statistics. I think everybody should have courses in those. And if you didn't get them in school, you can get them right here. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars in tuition and months or years in taking classes. You can do these in these bite-sized lessons and tutorials, quick guides presented in a well-paced game-like process that makes learning fun. You can do it in no time. Okay, let's just try it out. All right, so here's the app open. Here's the different categories. I'm going to go under scientific thinking since that's something I'm interested in. And you get a whole series of these different courses you can take. Nature is a puzzle, science rules, structures, flow, light, relativity. All right, let's try relativity theory. What do I know about relativity theory? Nothing. So let's see how well I do on that one. All right, time travel. Two-thirds the speed of light, I think, is the explanation there. Anyway, those are the choices. You pick the one. Correct. (laughs) See, if I can do this, you can do that. Anyway, check it out. That's just a fun example there. If I can figure out relativity based on this, you can learn anything you want through Brilliant. Again, go to brilliant.org slash skeptic uh, to get your 30 days free trial. And the first 200 of you get 20% off their annual subscription rate. Just go to it right now. Why would you not want to do this? This is so cool. All right, check it out. And thanks for listening. Here's our episode. What was it like working with Stephen Hawking? Give us a feel for the lab. And when you guys, when you say you work with, you guys are working, what is it you're doing when you're in that room? <laughs> uh, well, it was a 24, 24, 7, 7 kind of occupation with, with Hawking, right? Uh, it, never, it never stopped. He was uh, obsessed with, with physics, obsessed with life in general, I would say. Um, it was just very intense and a real, really fun, lots of, lots of passion. Um, but how did it work? It's impossible to describe theoretical physics um, because the best thing is not to have much of a plan, to be open, to try to follow your intuition. And I think what was Stephen's genius was to kind of translate our intuition or his intuition about these big human questions, like where we come from, what's our place in the universe, to translate these into what you could call uh, thought experiments. Theoretical physics is all about doing thought experiments with mathematics and equations and theories. And with these thought experiments, you're trying to push these theories and these models and these ideas to their limits. And you try to see where they break down. And if they break down, what is it? Why do they break down? What is the underlying assumption that doesn't hold inside black holes or at the Big Bang and so forth? And so it was a very... I, I experienced theoretical physics as an extremely fluid, imaginative, intuitive-driven, yet mathematically grounded discovery story. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I like that. Um, so had he not died in, what, 2018, this would have been his next book, probably co-authored with yourself, on his next big theory. Is that is that? Am I understanding that right? Well, we both felt towards the end of, of, of Stephen's life in 2016-17, we clearly arrived at what we thought was a, a key new insight, um, a new a new picture, a new a new vision of of the cosmos, of the early evolution of the cosmos, and shortly before he died, 
he told me it was time for a new book. So this is that book. Um, at the time, he could hardly he could hardly he could hardly speak anymore, hardly communicate even even through his uh, computer. Um, I do think this book, indeed, as you say, represents very accurately his thinking, his interpretation of the theory of the Big Bang uh, we arrived at. But of course, I've never been able to discuss the the broader, bigger picture um, behind it. Um, in a sense, it's all in our publications, you could say. It's all, it's all in our scientific publications, but the scientific publications are, of course, technical and therefore structured and organized in a way that fits within the uh, research field. Whereas these uh, bigger questions, um, which by which Hawking was very much guided in his cosmology throughout his life, I would say, these bigger questions are, are often only there in the background in our scientific work. And uh, we would discuss these, as you say, eh, over tea or in the pub or over dinner or at night. But what I've done in this book is to retell the story of our, of our 20 years by putting these uh, bigger questions from which our research emerged by putting these central and leaving the technical details. Put the technical details in the background. And so that's, the, that's I think, the, the, key, the key point of the book. So this is interesting because uh, it, it kind of comments on how science has done the philosophy of science. What do you mean a, a God's eye perspective on the universe? You mean we can't get outside of it, whereas you, in a laboratory you can get outside of a a, 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 you know, a model of atoms moving around or something like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Physics is, um, physics has taken a God's eye perspective uh, back since Copernicus and Galileo. It's the way physics has been constructed, in, invented, discovered. Um, it's reflected, for instance, in the fact that we have these laws the laws of physics are there as eternal truths, and we have uh, boundary conditions which we impose, which are not part of the laws. And so you have some sort of external viewpoint, external input. You define your experiment in your lab, for instance, um, and then you let it go. And um, this is fine. This is really, it, it has worked really great. And in fact, even in Astrophysics and cosmology, it is often fine because we rarely ask questions about truly the totality of reality. In cosmology, if you're interested in part of the evolution, you can put yourself out of it, you can put yourself before it or after it, and again work with the standard physics framework. It really only breaks down, and this is the central subject this is the central question that drove 20 years of collaboration between Stephen and I. It breaks down when you ask this deeper question, which Stephen loved to ask, like, why is the universe the way it is? Why does it appear designed? What is the relation? What is the connection, really, between our existence and the physics governing the universe? At that point, you cannot stay outside. Because, of course, the question itself involves us. And that really took us a long time to sort of break down this question and where is, where is, how do we change physics from within, really, to tackle that deeper question. And so that passage that you were reading, um, indeed, is the sort of key transition point in our collaboration or, or, and in the book from uh, a, the traditional God's eye viewpoint to another viewpoint which you could, which Stephen would call a worm's eye viewpoint from sort of from the inside, right? Um, 
And so I introduced a little bit sort of the notion of uh, a Hawking 1 and a Hawking 2 in my book, or, a or an early Hawking and a late Hawking. And by the early Hawking, I mean the one that took a God's eye viewpoint, the one that was looking for, like, like Albert Einstein, for the theory of everything, so as a sort of an eternal truth. And by the late Hawking, I mean the one, yeah, the, the one that changed his mind. Or scientists should change their mind when the evidence changes or the, the arguments are, are, are changing yeah, or whatever. Yeah, sure, sure. And I think I your new book is also something of a sequel to... Uh, oh, sorry, we're getting a little bit of a delay. I was just going to ask you about the grand design because it's also something of a sequel to the grand design or a different perspective, right? Uh, what did I write here? Um, re you replace, you're replacing the multiverse which was the presentation of the grand design, more or less, with a Darwinian model of cosmology and grand cosmic design. But grand design, I mean, the word design, that, that's something of a, I mean, because it, it isn't designed, because people think design, they think there's an outside designer, but that, that wasn't the point of that. So, so how is this different from the grand design? Well, as you were saying, the grand design, you could uh, frame, so to speak, where Hawking is sitting on the fence a little bit. It's sort of in between the, the early and the late Hawking. And on the one hand, um, he argues indeed against the idea that there is a kind of unique equation, uh, a formula, um, a theory that dictates how the universe should be uh, that would be a little that equation would then function a little bit like uh, yeah a designer or or uh, a transcendental truth or so um, and on the other hand but on the other hand he still holds on to that multiverse idea which we then say goodbye to in, in our later work. In fact, by the time the grand design was published, Stephen was already quite a leap further. further. Hawking had had long doubts on... You could see the multiverse as another kind of explanation for the design question. What do we mean, in fact, by this design question? We mean that uh, the universe, at least at the level of the physics, at least at the level of the laws of physics, seem to be just right for life to emerge. The laws of particle physics, um, the, the composition of the universe, the expansion history, everything seems to be just good. And so that evokes this question, why did the Big Bang get it? So get it totally right. Um, so then you, the first kind of explanation was, okay, maybe there's an equation behind it. I think that was what Stephen and many others and Einstein were thinking in the 80s. Einstein not, of course, but Stephen in the 80s. Um, and the multiverse gave a completely different viewpoint on this. If there are many universes, and uh, we are just in one of them, but there is a, a huge number of universes and many of them can be sterile. Many of them cannot be suitable for life to emerge. Well, and many of them can even have different laws of physics. Well, once in a while you're going to find one which is good. And surely we should be in a habitable universe. But I think Stephen was one of the first scientists, first cosmologists to realize the... Uh, depth of the problem with the, with the multiverse. The fact that it is not testable, uh, not falsifiable, the fact that invoking a zillion other universes to explain this one um, was not the way to go. But of course, it's easier said than done to then find an alternative of the um, that does work, right? And so 
that's what we that's what we developed essentially by taking a profoundly quantum viewpoint on the earliest stages of our universe. Mm, okay, so let me just see if I can rehash this for our listeners because I'm not in this field at all, so I can ask the dumb questions. The problem to solve is why is the universe tuned the way it is to give rise to complex uh, organisms and, and consciousness and us and so forth. The the weak, that, so this is the anthropic principle. So the weak one is that, well, it, the universe would have to be designed this way for us to exist. We can only be asking the question in a universe like this. The strong version of that is that some outside designer made it this way for whatever reason, wanted to bring us about or whatever, something like that. And And so the invoking of the multiverse is often done to say, well, there's, you know, countless universes, and we just happen to be one of the ones with the laws of nature that gives rise to us, and there's others that have laws of nature that don't give rise to cosmologists like you and people like me to ask the question. So um, that's the problem to be solved. The multiverse is one solution. If it's not testable, if it's not even in principle, then it's not science. What is it? Metaphysics or philosophy or religion or something like that, I guess. And so what you're saying is that in this book, you're trying to get around that and actually produce a testable hypothesis for this problem. Have I said that right? Right. But when I say it's not testable, it's because the anthropic principle introduces ambiguities in whatever you predict. So the anthropic principle plays the role of selecting a universe in this multiverse. The problem is that depending on what you call entropic observables or entropic properties of the universe, and what I call entropic properties of the universe may be different. And so both of us are going to land in a different universe and going to predict different physics. So it's kind of, it's almost like a, it's a breakdown of any sort of scientific predictive framework, whatever you put in, you get out. And if it doesn't agree with observations, you can put something else in. So you can always trade some sort of failure into a success by changing your assumptions about what you feel is entropic. And... So we, we have a name for this eh, in the field. Uh, it, it's a well-known name. It's called the measure problem. We don't have a good way to measure the weight or the relevance between different universes in the multiverse. And I think what happened in the last 20 years is that gradually it dawned upon the community of theoretical physicists and cosmologists that this measure problem that we were facing in, in, in multiverse cosmology was a, a really deep problem going at the roots of physics. And then, of course, the question comes, OK, what is it in the roots of physics that is preventing us, that is blocking us, that is uh, obstructing progress? And that, I think, was really the core of my, my entire uh, voyage with PhD. So I'm rephrasing mm. what you were, you were saying. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but so just uh, w one more pushback on this. So, so theists that I debate about the existence of God, who are invoking the fine-tuning argument and so on, will say, well, this multiverse thing is just a hand-waving argument to wave away God or a des intelligent designer. It's your faith. It's no more testable than my God as an explanation. So each of us has an explanation. Who's to say who's right? Wait, so is that a question? Uh, um... <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just, if you heard that argument from a theist saying, you're just making this multiverse thing up uh, so you don't have to be invoke the God hypothesis. Okay, okay, right. So in a sense, I... Agree is a big word, but I do agree with the statement that the multiverse as it stands in conjunction with the anthropic principle is not proper science and therefore indeed on the same footing as many other kinds of explanations. 
But this was precisely the motivation and the reason for us to revisit our scientific principles and to come up with uh, a model of the early universe which is falsifiable, testable, or at least which pro produces unambiguous predictions. Because that's the starting point, right? When we say the multiverse is not testable, it is not because we can't go to another universe to check it out. No, it is because the multiverse theory does not lead to unambiguous predictions for what we in this universe should observe. And that is something indeed which is, from a scientific approach, unacceptable. Okay, let's get into your theory. Uh, so the book is called On the Origin of Time. What is time? Time used to be something pretty metaphysical. For Newton, it was pretty metaphysical, right? It was just uh, there, like an absolute, it was absolute time in Newton's time. <laughs> um, but um, Einstein made time into a physical field like any other. And so that became a lot more interesting. Um, but then, of course, the big, big implication of Einstein's theory of relativity is that both space and time can be curved and, 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 and time can flow at different rates. But the biggest implication, of course, is that time can end inside black holes and, can, and begin in a Big Bang. Uh, so there is a sort of really profound, uh, or do you say, the finiteness sneaking into physics at the level of space and time. That's the legacy of Einstein's theory. And so the origin of time, why is my book called The Origin of Time? For two reasons. But the first one is, of course, that the Big Bang is not just an explosion, but it's really, as best as we know, the origin of time, of the past, the, the past limit of our past. Okay, but even the concept of uh, an origin of time because then, I mean, maybe this is just a restriction of our cognition uh, and our concepts, but, you know, how, what, we, I can't even ask what was there before time, right? Because that, right. that, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> so I'm not even sure how to ask the question. What, you know, why would, how, what was, what did the bang, what banged the bang before there was nothing? That's right. That's the question we have to, we have to give up on. And it's very explicit in, in, in the final theory that, that Stephen and I developed. Um, because loosely speaking, in the model of the Big Bang that we developed, time going backwards is an emergent phenomenon. And, phenomenon, and every emergent phenomenon has its limits. And it's almost like as if we're losing the dimension of time when we delve deep into the Big Bang. Hawking used to say that time sort of, well, he used to say confusingly that time became imaginary, by which he really meant that the dimension of time bends into a space dimension and of course then as you as you were saying then asking questions about causality or cause and effect it just it's just not possible anymore uh, but losing the dimension of time is is key is a key uh, insight i think of einstein's theory and uh, how the problem was that einstein's theory couldn't answer really anything about what then happened. And that's because Einstein's theory was a classical theory, and really it put that origin of time, strictly speaking, from a mathematical viewpoint, Einstein's theory put the origin of time outside physics, outside science. Uh, so as, as a sort of unanswerable question, which of course he didn't like himself, and that was the reason why he was so much against the Big Bang, uh, because of course he saw that his old theory was, was doomed at the Big Bang. Um, and Hawking developed famously uh, this, this sort of 
geometric way of thinking, so a kind of Einstein kind of thinking about space and time, but he developed this, in a way you could say that he sort of bent space and time further than Einstein dared to do and unlocked uh, the quantum realm of space-time, where the time dimension uh, can disappear, as it does uh, in our model in, in the Big Bang. And so, yes, I'm sorry, mm. there is... Yeah, let me... Let me... No, 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 no. Oh, well, so I was going to, I was going to, I was going to point out the, the infinite, the problem with the infinite regress series of arguments in any case is the theist doesn't, uh, has the same problem. You can just ask, well, where did the intelligent designer come from? Who designed the designer? And, you know, at some point causal explanation just has to stop. You just have to say, okay, we're going to start our model here and run it forward. So you guys are starting just right at the big bang or shortly after and so then what happens? There's like just a quantum field or something. This is where quantum physics comes in. And the problem you're trying to solve is how to square that with Einsteinian relativity. Right. But I, 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 th I think you're right. So what, what differentiates this uh, model from uh, the infinite regress kind of reasoning, which, by the way, includes the multiverse, Right? Because in the multiverse, we say the Big Bang was not really the Big Bang, but there, and there, there are not just our laws, but there are meta laws governing the multiverse, and there's a bigger space and so forth. It's very infinite regress kind of reasoning. Indeed. So what differentiates our model from those models is the... We accept a genuine origin. And we try to model a genuine origin. And that's why... Um, I have made the analogy with Darwinian thinking because, as, you, as, as we all know, Darwinian evolution happened to an interplay between variation and selection. But if we trace the tree of life backwards, the laws of biology disappear and we have a genuine origin. And before that origin, we have no biology and no laws and no law, no laws of Mendel, no laws of DNA and whatever. Stephen, the model that I developed with Stephen is very similar. It's a genuine origin, but now at the level of the laws of physics. So our statement is that if we go deep into the Big Bang, we have a similar kind of evolution as with similar kind of principles as Darwin's, but happening deep down at the level of the physics, a series of transitions in the earliest stages of the universe through which the forces diversified, the types of particles emerged, and a sort of the tree of physical laws, if you wish, that we know today, took shape. So kind of a co-evolution with the, with the early universe. But the consequence is that if we go backwards, Deep into the Big Bang, we lose that diversity. The laws become simpler, more symmetric, and the last transition is the one in which time morphs into space. And with that, the laws of physics themselves disappear, just like the laws of biology disappear at the origin of life. And that is, I think, the key point. It gives a completely different sort of picture or vision uh, yeah, what cosmology and physics are ultimately about. It's much more um, some sort of... It's almost like putting the, the evolutionary character of the physical laws uh, finally uh, up front and, and central. Of course, that evolution happened deep, deep into the Big Bang, and we, and we know very little about it. And that's also the reason why we think of the laws of physics as eternal truths. It's a kind of evolution which was frozen a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, and we build up the entire universe on that foundation. I, we are kind of saying that you, we shouldn't think of this as a, as a foundation. With the Big Bang, also the laws disappear. That's, that's the crux of our, of our theory. Interesting. So you're saying that the principle of uniformitarianism, that is the laws of nature, that we observe here on Earth probably work the same way on some other planet, say geologically speaking, or astronomically speaking, the gravity operates the same way in other galaxies and so on. 
and we can make that assumption and build our models from there. But what you're saying is if you go back far enough in time, that wasn't always the case. The laws of nature changed or they're different now than they were then. Something like that? Yes, but deep, deep, deep into that earlier stage of the Big Bang. Exactly. Yes. Right. Could it be something like, uh, you know, that, that problem of explaining the acceleration of the expanding universe, maybe this, what, what's the explanation of dark energy, right? Maybe mm. that is itself a different, no, I'm, I'm not saying this right. Are the laws of, is that law of nature different then than it is now? Something like that? In a sense, that is also what our what our model says. Uh, you you must have heard about inflation, right? The sort of the the very rapid phase of expansion in the early universe, which is driven by essentially a kind of dark energy, which uh, is envisioned to have been a lot larger then than it is now. So indeed, if you if you think about the dark energy and the cosmological constant as yeah, and for all purposes, that's correct. As a law of nature, today, during inflation, that law of nature was very different. Can I ask you another kind of philosophical question on laws of nature? What are they? I mean, it's almost like the concept is reified, like it's a thing that's out there to be discovered. But in fact, is it actually just a mathematical description of what objects do when they're interacting in space, something like that? Okay, that's a good question. Eh? Um, <laughs> it's at, in a sense, it, it's it's at the heart of it's a, it's at the core of my book, right? Um, because what I was just saying implies, yeah, if the laws themselves dissolve into the Big Bang. then we shouldn't think of them as eternal, transcendental truths. Uh, then we should really think of them also a as a product of evolution. It's just that the evolution uh, is hidden from, it it's hidden deep into the heat of the Big Bang and we have almost, almost no fossils of that earliest, earliest, deepest stage of evolution. That's in a sense, you could say that we are kind of in the same boat as Darwin in the 19th century, who had no, who had almost no fossils to put together his idea, right? Um, so it's a bit similar. But the crux of my title on the origin of time, I, I, I told you about the first reason for the title. The first reason was that the Big Bang is the origin of time. But the second reason, of course, is that it's a variant of Darwin's title on the origin of species. So I'm trying to convey the message that we should think of the origin of time as a kind of evolutionary process driven by quantum randomness and, and quantum selection in it, on its own. Um, and so... You could then ask the question, and this was your question, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. Um, what is then the foundation of these laws? If it is not, if it is not, if the foundation is not to be found in profound mathematics that somehow transcends our universe, well, then I think the foundation is and this is sort of the crux of our, of our theory, it's sort of upside down. It, the, the laws are contingent on our perspective as observers, in the quantum sense, within this universe. Just like the law that all life of, on Earth is based on DNA and Mendel's laws of biology are contingent, our regularities, patterns in nature, which you can discover and ex post facto only, but not uh, as prior truths. If we were to rerun the evolution of the universe, or if we were to rerun the evolution of life on Earth, we would arrive at a different tree of laws, and we would arrive at a different tree of life. That's So in a sense, I'm trying to ontologically 
because that was your question, your difficult question, ontologically, I'm trying to put biology and physics um, on more of an equal footing. So, uh, well, I was going to follow up on that because you quoted in there in your book um, Steve Gould's thought experiments on rewinding the tape of life and playing it back again. So let's explore that for a second. Uh, you know, Dan Dennett was the first to point out in his book Darwin's Dangerous Idea. He has a whole chapter on Gould that technically, if it's a read-only memory tape that you're playing back, it's going to be exactly the same because that's just a recording of what happened. But what Gould really meant is not a literal tape, but just just go back to the start of time and re rerun it again. And you get these contingent events like the extinction of the dinosaurs. Had that not happened, mammals would probably not have evolved to the extent that they did. And we probably wouldn't be here. OK, so from there, the question is, to what extent are the laws of nature fairly well determining? I mean, the channel, the channels of variation that you can get are fairly narrow or are they fairly wide? So for a while, I, 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 I like Gould's uh, rewind the tape argument and the role of contingency. But then your colleague over in the paleontology department there at Cambridge, Simon Conway Morris, you know, wrote a book in response to Gould's argument, particularly over the Cambrian explosion, that in fact, it's not as random as you think. There is something called convergent evolution. And that if you rewound the tape, you're going to get organisms that look more or less alike. Like if you're an organism in the water, you have to have something like a fusiform body, you know, with fins on one end and a mouth on the other. Or if you're a, if you're a mammal, you have to have limbs to move around on the land and you got to have, you know, the sensory equipment on one end and the waste disposal system at the other end and so on. There's only so many variations on a theme, right? So if we did encounter aliens, they're not going to be exactly like us, of course, but bipedal primates, but they, they if they're, if they're land-based, they have to have certain kind of structures to survive. So, they're going to have something like eyes and brains and ears and, and wings if they want to, you know, survive in the air and flippers and a fusiform body if they're in the water and so on. Uh, and so I, I always thought that was an interesting debate. I, you know, there's no, I don't know what the solution to that is. It's some tug and pull between contingency and chance versus the laws of nature. So now apply that problem to what you're arguing for cosmology. To what extent to the laws of nature? If you rewound the universe, we'd end up with something like what we have, or or not. Good, great, yeah. So indeed, as you were, as you say, it's 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 really this interplay eh, between uh, constraints, which often often come from from the lower kind of levels of evolution, the earthly environment, for instance, and 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 the oceans. What are you gonna do? You're gonna do some develop some sort of life that is adaptable to that um, situation. Um, the same with the famous uh, John von Neumann thought experiment about DNA. Hmm? So John von Neumann drew a kind of um, cellular automaton, really, yeah? sort of a kind of structure which he envisioned uh, could reproduce itself and he drew this structure way before Watson and Crick discovered DNA. And if you compare the two, of course, they're not the same. But rough, in, in, roughly, you can, you, can see, you can see similarities. And so that is extremely interesting that von Neumann, purely on computational grounds, arrives at something like um, DNA. Um, so at all levels, there is this debate between... What is the what is the divergence, the divergent forces, and what are the convergent forces? Same with uh, same with uh, Yuri Harari, eh, who who studies human history and who argues that this is an extremely divergent uh, process. Um, so in that sense, Simon Conway would have a hard time, I think, uh, arguing also at that level for convergence. So now we de now we descend. To the level of physics, what are the constraints? And um, and I, I yeah I, I thought about it and and and, and I discuss it in my book. Um, and also there you have you have you have this same this same interplay that you mentioned between um, convergence and divergence. Of course, there's 
there's not much contingency because uh, the further back you go, the less, the more primitive the environment, really. Um, so, but there are two, two things. If unification involves these extra dimensions that string theory envisions, the scope for variation seems extremely, extremely large. Uncomputa uncomputably large, in fact. Eh? So, um, so that's, that's, that's a strong divergent argument, which probably plays out in the very early transitions where the shape of the extra dimensions is also involved in shaping the effective laws that emerge. On the other hand, there is this deepest layer, the one that we were mentioning earlier, the layer at which, at the bottom, where time turns into space, that is a contingent element in our model, that is a constraining element, that is something you can't just get away, that, that, that description of, of really sort of closing physics, closing time, that is constraining. Not everything, not, not everything goes there. For instance, that, that sort of last transition goes together very much, is, resonates with this idea of inflation that we mentioned. And inflation, of course, will be a small, will, will, that, that, that will select a subset of possible universes. And so not, not, not everything will be possible there. And so I completely agree. That is the interesting thing to develop now. What is contingent? What is necessary? And the way we phrase this is, what are the correlations? If this and this and this, then it, the universe must also have that and that and that property. Um, yeah, this is, this is largely unexplored uh, territory, yeah, but it's a little bit like what biologists indeed eh, do, eh? If, you, if you sort of try to reconstruct the tree, the tree of life in great detail, you're going to find on the one hand correlations be between all these species, on the other hand, you're going to be confronted with accidents here and there uh, at the level of mutations or at the level of the environment and then so forth, which uh, have taken hist biological history in a certain direction. I'm going to point out just parenthetically, it's not central to your book, but since you mentioned Harari and, and kind of the contingent nature of human history, I don't think it's, I, I would disagree that it's not that contingent, it's not that random. Now, it might not have been Christianity per se, but any religion that doesn't require much to join you don't have to give up any <laughs> foreskin if you're a guy. That's that's an incentive to join, right? And if you have a missionary program and you have a high fecundity program, your religion is going to grow. Versus if you have no missionary program, like Jews, you know they don't they don't go out to proselytize, right? So their numbers I do agree with and that. the educated yeah. Jews don't have very many babies, right? So you know, or something like the rise of the nation state. You know, if you have enough people crowded in an area, you need some kind of leviathan to run the show and have a court system and so on. You need something like a nation state with a legal system and something. So there, maybe there's a certain amount of inevitability, not inevitability, but constraining laws. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But I do think the constraints and the contingency are mostly operational on the sort of large arc, large features, uh, coarse-grained properties, eh? such, such like the rough form of DNA or the rough flow of history or the fact that most of human history has played out on the surface of the earth. Yeah, sure, stuff like that. But I think it's more in the nitty-gritty details, uh, in the fine structure, in the specificity of the complex systems that we find uh, randomness um, dominating. And the key question is then indeed, in this giant space of possible universes, do we, uh, where, where is that balance between random accidents um, and on the one hand, and, and as you say, contingency? So far, I've only sort of within the, within this model that I discussed with Hawking, that I developed with Hawking, it's only 
some sort of no, some notion of early inflation that I see as a key um, necessary um, feature. And of course, it's not nothing because, as you know, it implies an early phase of inflation implies there will be some sort of seats for stars and galaxies. And so, yeah, you're on a certain trajectory which excludes other trajectories. Yes. Okay, I see. Can you explain for us the double slit experiment which you discuss in the book and to what and, and the different interpretations of that? Because I think one of the multiverse hypotheses derives from that. All right, and, and then how does that uh, influence your theory with Steven? Uh, yes, yes, we can, we can discuss this. Um, the double split, slit experiment. Um, so you fire particles or photons through two slits and you put a screen behind those slits and you see what happens. And you find that if you run this experiment for a while, you see some interference pattern arising on the screen. And that interference pattern arises even if you fire, and that's the crucial point, particle by particle, once one particle by one particle. So if you dim your, your light source or if you dim your electron gun so much, that it's only one photon or one electron at a time that goes through these slits. If you wait for a while, still this interference pattern arises. And so that showed that these individual particles somehow know about both slits. That they have wave-like properties which and so that they interfere um, when, when they go wavy through both slits and that would then result in, in that pattern uh, if, if, you, if, if you keep going. And so that certain probability to arrive uh, on different spots on the screen is, is different depending on you are. Um, so there's a, there's a genuine uncertainty in which slit the particle, in, uh, the particle comes through. And the way that the double slit experiment sort of enters, enters in my book uh, is two, twofold, really. At the first level is the one that I explained. You, can, um, you have to describe those particles as probability waves, wave functions. Um, the second level is really um, once you start probing once you add a layer to the double slit experiment and you probe, yeah, okay, let me add a detector, let me check to through which slit this particle really came. Eh? So you sort of try to cheat. And when you cheat, the particle will adapt in a way and the interference pattern will disappear and you will know which slit the particle came through, but your interference pattern will, will disappear. Uh, and this sort of crea John Wheeler came up with a, with, a, with a beautiful sort of variation of this setup. He said, all right, so this is interesting. If we look at the particle, we know which slit it goes through, but we lose the interference. If we don't look, we have these interference. What happened, he said, if we decide to try to trick the particle and if we place the detectors, not at the two slits, but further down at the screen. And so we only, we only decide after the particle has gone through the slits whether we are going to look for where it came from, through which slit, or whether we're going to just let it hit the screen. So he sort of turned the slit, the screen, into a Venetian blind, which he could open and close in his thought experiment, right? I told you phys theoretical physics is about thought experiments, uh, which he could open and close after the particle had gone through the two slits. So that was a truly genius experiment, thought experiment, which since, by the way, has been performed. And, and, um, and so 
the particles always get it right. If you decide to close the Venetian blind and do the usual thing, you get your inferiority pattern. If you decide to open the Venetian blind and put the, put the detectors at work to see which slit the particle came through, you find no interferency pattern. How is this possible? How can the particle know in advance what you, the observer, will do at a later time? It is truly beautifully, it's truly beautiful quantum theory. And the reason is, how do we explain this? How does quantum theory explain this? Quantum theory explains this precisely by really describing these particles as wave functions, as uncertain, ghostly wave functions, which really don't do anything concretely until we ask a specific question, until we specify whether we're going to close or open the Venetian blind. That decision, that act of observation, turns the wave function, the past history, or determines what we can say about the past history of those particles. What a facet of the particle's wave function manifests itself as a, as a tangible reality. And now you see me coming. I think that's why you asked this question. Um, Hawking essentially after the multiverse paradoxes drove him mad, Hawking essentially decided we're going to have to take a profoundly quantum viewpoint. We're going to have to, in order to sort of get a grip on, on the multiverse or to do this differently. And so he essentially took Wheeler's particle quantum thinking and applied it boldly to, to the early universe, to the Big Bang, and that's what our theory is about. That was a long explanation. No, no, that's a, that's a good start because I think from there much <laughs> follows. But on this, uh, just, just a, a clarification, the observer doesn't have to be a sentient being, right? It could just be a camera no. or anything that the uh, particle interacts with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a common confusion, and it's good that you ask this. Um, no, no. In fact, it's really a human being down at the quantum level. The actual quantum observation, uh, with anything that we interact with, has already been done uh, by the environment. Uh, even even a lone photon of the of the microwave background could be the, a quantum, or could act like a quantum observer. Um, and if you think about the early universe, where we have where we don't even have, yeah, particles, and, and and then it is really the interaction with the primeval, the interaction between the primeval fields that were around, that were doing the observation. So it's the universe itself, which acts as a quantum uh, observer. Uh, sure, sure, sure. This is this is key. Well, I bring this up because, as you probably know, that there's a lot of quantum consciousness uh, ideas floating around out, out there that somehow it's consciousness that brings these things into existence or determines the way things unfold. And maybe there's a cosmic consciousness or God is consciousness or we're as conscious beings, godlike or something like that. So it's not sentience consciousness in that sense that you're talking about here with the double Slit experiment, but then there's that related one, you know, that Einstein called spooky action at a distance, right? The spin of one subatomic particle determines the spin of another one on the other side of the room, the other side of the galaxy, the other side of the universe. What, how does the information get there, across there? And as I understand it, it's not, it's not exchanging information. It's something else going on. Maybe you want to comment on that uh, problem. Yeah, so I, I totally agree that, it, that this is not about consciousness. In fact, I think I, I once brought it up uh, in my discussions with Hawking, and he immediately blocked it. Um, sure, sure, this, this quantum act of observation is something more fundamental, something more basic. Of course, um, that 
the, the, the entanglement that you refer to, Einstein's spooky action on a distance, uh, spooky action on a distance, yeah. Yeah, that's also a source of information, but there the, what's spooky about it is the fact that the information is not encoded uh, right here or right there, but really in the entanglement, in the connection between two distant uh, particles. And um, so that's, yeah, that's a genuine quantum form of information. You wouldn't be able to do that in any, in any classical way, right? Uh, but very important. It plays an important role in our, in our later work. And it plays an important role in um, quantum computing, for instance, right? Right. I love another passage here that got my attention from your book. Uh, okay. In a recent tribute to Wheeler, John Wheeler, Kip Thorne, rec Kip Thorne recalled a lunch with him and Feynman in 1971 at the Burger Continental near Caltech, a diner Stephen too, fre too frequented while at Caltech. We used to hold our skeptic dinners uh, at the Burger Continental after our lectures at Caltech. It's really funny. Oh, really? Uh, uh -huh. And then over American food, Wheeler, uh, Armenian food, Wheeler described to us his idea that the laws of physics are mutable. Those laws must have come into being. What principles determine the laws, uh, which laws emerge in our universe? So this is kind of what we've been discussing. So just uh, parenthetically, the Feynman's idea of sum over histories is this along the same lines that you're talking about here? There's just particles could take all the different pathways, but but they're more probably likely to take one versus another one. Yes, it's it's yeah, sure, sure, sure. At the level at that level, that that's what it is, right? Um, Feynman's formulation of quantum mechanics is a very useful, a very tangible way of thinking about these wave functions. Particles take all sorts of routes, and so very importantly. You can't say you can't you can't say you can't say much about it without asking a specific question, and the kind of observation or the kind of question that you're asking determines which parts, um, so to speak, become yeah real. I dare say <laughs> um, become yeah rise to the forefront, and so the key here is that there is a sort of retroactive aspect sneaking in cosmology when you do it that quantum way, because the contingent configuration, so this is what Stephen called uh, a top-down perspective on the Big Bang. Eh? So he, if you think quantum mechanically, you don't think just in terms of a prior state which you evolved deterministically forward. No, you think about an abstract wave function which doesn't really provide the answer to anything until you really specify a situation, an observational configuration. And that is like asking a grand question of that abstract wave function, which then crystallizes for you a history or a subset of histories, including, if you go back to the earliest stages, a specific sequence of um, transitions that crystallize the effective flaws which you have. Yeah, <laughs> right. And by the way, Murray Gellman was a, a longtime supporter of the skeptics when we first started. He called this I quantum see. flap doodle, this whole idea of, you know, extrapolating from quantum physics, uh, all this kind of Eastern mystical philosophy and psychic power and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, that was kind of funny. So I was reading from uh, this quote from Stephen Hawking in his No Boundary theory that he presented in A Brief History of Time, the universe would be completely self-contained and now affected by anything outside and not affected by anything outside of itself. It would neither be created nor destroyed. It would just be. And then he famously finished that line there, that paragraph with what place then for a creator, which caused a, a, a media furor over that. So when you're talking now about a top-down model of cosmology, you're this is different than the no boundary as I just described? It's a different interpretation of the no-boundary, and it's a further development yeah. of the no-boundary. So okay. the, the paragraph that, that, you, that you were just quoting is, the, is what I call the, the young Hawking. It is the Hawking who was looking for uh, 
the ultimate formula for an equation that would describe how and why the universe was created. And indeed, just like Einstein, the idea was that that equation both the early Hawking and Einstein, I think, believed very much in Spinoza's God, that this would be sort of the ultimate expression of uh, a godlike harmony. And um, the old no boundary proposal didn't work because it predicted uh, an essentially empty universe without observers, <laughs> if you wish, um, and without galaxies. And so this was, and as a consequence, of course, the theory remained controversial, but somehow, but so, so this, is my, this is my impression, in all these years I worked with Stephen and we didn't really have, uh, also before we came to that top-down view, he never doubted that theory, even though, of course, he knew it didn't work. But he, for him, the no-boundary proposal, I mean, he once, he once told me he thought that was his greatest discovery. He had, had this intuition that, that it was right. But, of course, he couldn't get it to work. And the reason is that he took this God's eye view on his own theory. So I think he underestimated the, his, his own theory, just like Einstein did. Once we took this... Once we took a quantum interpretation, once we put ourselves inside and worked top-down, worked ex post facto, the no-boundary proposal does select uh, reasonable, reasonable histories. But it comes, it comes with the ontological or epistemological consequence that we were discussing earlier, namely that you no longer regard it as um, a transcendental prior truth that's, that tells you how and why the universe was created, but as a mechanism for essentially closing our past and let time disappear, and in a sense imposing a certain, a certain finitude in science, um, almost like a statement that um, there is a kind of limit to what can to where the laws reach, I would say. So it's a very different interpretation and a mm. huge shift, right, because, a huge philosophical shift. Right, because you uh, have a, another quote from Hawking, the anthropic principle is a counsel of despair. It is a negation of our hopes of understanding the underlying order of the universe on the basis of science. Yeah, that's a cool one. But you also have here another quote from Hawking, the history of the universe depends on the question you ask. Now, that's a curious thing. Uh, it's almost like um, it's dependent on, well, what did Hawking call that in, in Len Milan now in The Grand Design? Model-dependent realism. Reality depends on the model you're using. You're doing something different with this now, though, right? Yeah, he never, he never mentioned that to me, uh, the model-dependent realism. Um, that quote, when he, told, when he told that to me, um, it had everything to do with a, a sort of his, his somewhat intuitive, poetic, uh, oracle-like way of describing um, the act of observation in the cosmological context. Um, by the question you ask, he essentially meant, okay, um, we have these and these, these and these properties and physical forces and particles and so forth. It is the top-down input. It is the analog of Darwin's fossils, which select in conjunction with uh, the 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 no boundary origin, um, a subset of histories that contribute to our observations. So I interpreted, well, maybe I'm wrong, eh? but <laughs> at least when my interpretation at the time when he told me um, that was all in the context of our discussions of, of um, 
what what among the two of us and what I in my book in in, in chapter six call top down cosmology. Right. Since I only read I the suppose... books and not the technical papers, uh, it, just tell me what. Just tell us what the reception so far to your and Stephen's theory has been from your colleagues in the papers that you've published. Right. So in the papers, of course, we did not develop that broader Darwinian, um, more ontological, bigger question picture. Uh, for that, you have to wait till the book appears in the States uh, to see the reactions. At the level of the, of the papers, the last series of papers were especially geared towards implementing that quantum view uh, using the uh, holography, yeah, using the discovery of holography in theoretical physics. So you've probably heard of this, right? That in the last 20, 25 years, uh, holography has been has been yeah, the talk of town among theoretical physicists. And um, because we see in holography a way for quant quantum theory and, and uh, relativity to work together. And of course, holography has mainly been developed in the context of uh, either black holes, where from a quantum holographic perspective, uh, you would say that the information, that everything you can know about a black hole is, is, is located on its horizon surface. And in the context of, again, thought experiments with and with in in highly yeah in mathematical artificial universes that don't expand but where we can um get a handle on um so to speak the dictionary between on the one hand the quantum description and on the other hand the gravitational description what i did in the last few years with hawking and which is turning into a field of its own is to apply these holographic ideas to the early evolution of an expanding universe. And what was one of the what was one of the wonderful Eureka moments between us, I would say, is that the no boundary idea which you mentioned, the whole time goes into space construction, is in fact what emerges from taking a holographic perspective. So very important point is that when we talk about holography, when we talk about a hologram, we always think that the extra dimension that sort of pops out of the hologram, that this is a, a, an extra space dimension. But when we apply these ideas of holography to the early evolution of the universe, we found that it is the time dimension that is the emergent one. The, holograph the, holograph the hologram sort of uncodes in Einstein's spooky action way an extra dimension, but that extra dimension is the past time evolution. And if you think about it, this is exactly what cosmology needed. For 90 years, we have been confronted with the problem of the origin of time. The Big Bang is the origin of time. And so it's you're not going to solve this as long as you don't have a model in which time is not a fundamental thing that you put in a priori, but which in which time is an emergent phenomenon. And to my amazement, holography does precisely that. And so and it clicks, it fits, it resonates beautifully with the no boundary construction that Hawking and Hartle uh, came up with in the eighties, um, in the top down way, eh? so in in uh, interesting. So time, yeah. T so time is a you would describe time as an emergent property of the laws of physics. That is correct, and that and the laws of physics contingent on our observational situation. Those are the two great ideas in my book, yes. <laughs> I mean, to be clear, <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't clear already, I'm going to say it. Uh, to be clear, this is, of course, a, a, a grand hypothesis, right? As we were saying earlier, uh, 
it's a little bit like the like, like Darwin in the 19th century. This hypothesis uh, will have to be developed on theoretical grounds. This holographic view of cosmology, of time, has to be developed and understood uh, in great detail. And one can also hope it can be tested. We, uh, at some point, one can hope we can get our fossils of the Big Bang by looking deeper into the... Uh, into the into the earliest eras, right? And so I view the observations of the early universe a little bit as the analog of the fossils that Darwin needed, and I view holographic cosmology a little bit as the analog of, um, say, genetics, molecular genetics, which essentially provided the microscopic mechanism behind uh, Darwin's picture. Yeah. So there's interesting. I should point out in the history and philosophy of science that y you can develop a theory without a mechanism as at least a, a place to start and in the future test it and find the mechanism. Darwin didn't have a mechanism for genetics that we don't get that until Crick and Watson. Right. Uh, and yet the theory of evolution was accepted because the evidence was overwhelming that it was happening, whatever it was down at the molecular level that was happening. And, you know, Alfred Wegener proposed that continents were drifting in the 1930s. And it was pretty clear that something was going on because the pieces seemed <laughs> to fit. But it wasn't until the 1960s that we had a mechanism of plate tectonics driven by these huge um, uh, fluid cells underneath the continental crust and so on. So what you're proposing is that there probably is an underlying mechanism in these laws of physics that we can get to through the hologram or whatever model you propose there. Would LIGO testing for gravitational waves be one form of testing or might the James Webb uh, telescope find something or how, how are we going to know, say, in the decades to come? Right, right. Yeah, very good question. Um, yeah, so James Webb looks at photons, sadly, um, and so it's not getting us far enough back into the earliest stages. Uh, but you're right that in principle, gravitational waves, which uh, even the earliest stages of the universe, um, right at the Big Bang, in fact, or, or, or even uh, in that inflationary phase, which is a fraction of a fraction of a second, gravitational waves just travel through it. The universe is transparent to gravitational waves still from its birth onwards. So you're right that probably there we we have the those are probably the fossils we should be hunting for um, the various transitions in the early universe which sort of um, crystallized the the law, the effective laws of physics say the, those various transitions are pretty violent and can go together with bursts of gravitational waves those bursts of gravitational waves should still be around, but of course, by now they're they're buried. They're buried under under a ton of other gravitational waves that has that have been created since. And so these are not the signals that that LIGO is gonna see. You will need uh, future gravitational wave observatories with a better precision and probably. Um, a much longer wavelength, so much larger observatories, maybe space missions like like LISA, um, to really hunt for these uh, primordial gravitational waves, as as, as you could uh, say. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that that would be a very promising route, sure. Interesting. Okay, Thomas, I think I got the big picture here from uh, your book of your of cool, your theory you. with Stephen. Um, you also have a quote from Steven Weinberg, so let's just pull out and look at the bigger picture for as we close things up here. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. <laughs> I think this is what bothers, uh, you know, religiously minded people with the kind of stuff you're doing. Like you're really bumping up against the ultimate questions here, right? And if you're what you're describing is just doesn't need a creator or a designer, then what's the point of it all? How do you come to grips with that question? I, I take a different view. I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I quoted 
Weinberg there, but I also wrote that I don't share his feeling. And I find that, well, Weinberg was one of those people who were brilliant, brilliant scientists, but he too took a God's eye perspective on the lot. And ontologically, very fundamentally, if you're going to drive at those biggest questions in a way that separates the human condition from the laws that you're discovering, it's never going to be satisfying. I'm trying with this book to give us the outlines, the rough outlines for a different worldview in which there need not be a separation fundamentally between the laws of physics and our existence, in which the laws, even at the bottom level, are contingent on our human condition. And it comes with a certain finiteness. I give up on prior truths and eternal truths, but I think we're going to emerge stronger from this. And we already are emerging stronger. For instance, in contrast to the multiverse, we now have a model which unambiguously can predict correlations between this and that, between, a, between our, our certain properties relevant for life and other properties of the universe. So I think it is in the interconnections, in the correlations between different facets of the universe that we might eventually find this um, a positive worldview. I like that. That's good. Right. Uh, I, I knew Steven Weinberg a little bit, mostly because traveling in atheist circles. So he did have something of a reputation of being a little kind of an angry atheist a little bit. Um, and so maybe some of that uh, fuels the interpretation of right, comments right, like right. that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, you talk about the early Stephen Hawking and the later Stephen Hawking. It's the kind of thing you hear like the, the early Van Gogh before he was an impressionist. And then the later Van Gogh, we came, came well, there was no impressionist ism to become. <laughs> he created it in part, or, you know, the early uh -huh. Jackson Pollock or the later Jackson Pollock. But I like to think what you're doing is more than art. It's not just an artsy trend, right. That could go this way or this, that way. Hopefully it's driven by, well, mathematics and empiricism. What, you know, look out the window, What's the world actually like? Sure, sure, sure. So I th you're touching on a very important point. Um, Stephen refused for absolutely and consistently to uh, talk about uh, philosophical positions independently of our uh, scientific work. So he, he loved to sort of attack the most fundamental questions to try to attack these, to try to study these on uh, with our models and, and, and in the scientific context, but never sort of freewheeling philosophical thoughts uh, at all. And so the early and the late Hawking is, is, yeah, it's a good point. It's not about, ah, I'm going to change philosophical position. No, it is being forced to adopt a different position because the math is driving you towards this. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, it, it was cool. Right? On the one hand, he denounced philosophy. On the other hand, his scientific work was <laughs> philosophically <laughs> pretty productive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember when he made that comment, philosophy is dead. <laughs> All my philosopher right. friends were like, what? <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> I mean, because right. in a way, what si science itself is a kind of branch of philosophy. You are doing philosophy when you're doing science. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Last question. Uh, for you personally or as a scientist, is there room for a deity or God in your epistemology and cosmology at all? Is it just a mystery? Is it just, you know, we don't know and never will? Or how do you think about that? Well, I'm not religious personally, but it didn't escape me that um, 
the picture that we arrived at in which you let physics, in a sense, disappear into the Big Bang, comes with a certain... It's, it, I, I think it creates room or space for different spheres of thought. It, it's a picture in which science does not claim to be um, giving us the absolute answers, but more a picture in which science seeks deeper and deeper interconnections between all facets of nature. And so, loosely speaking, you could say, I'm not sure Stephen would agree with this, eh? uh, loosely speaking, I think it's, I think it's, it, it, leaves, it leaves some space for mystery. And therefore, for other spheres of thought, religious, religious spheres, I think what's important is not to mix these two. Um, there, is, there is not one universal language or one universal answer. It seems to me that uh, science serves its purpose and um, religion serves different purposes. And there's no need to there's no need for the two of them to um, interfere all that much. I think. Mm. Yeah. So pragmatically speaking, that is often the case. <laughs> That's true. I mean, you don't go to the paleontologist for your your morals, right? right. But on the other hand, maybe philosophers have something to say about it as well, or scientists when they're doing philosophy. Something like that. Yes, I can see that. And I, you know, some of Steve Gould's non-overlapping magisteria, you know, is admirable in terms of like, can't we all just get along? Yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, but on the other hand, there are conflicts. You know, at some point, uh, the Earth is either 10,000 years old or it's four and a half billion years old. It's not in between there. One of them is wrong, right? So, you know, it's, it depends on the claims being made by the theist, I guess. Yes, I do agree with that. I do agree with that. Um Sure, sure, sure. Um, re, the, the, yeah, the entire uh, religious uh, literature should be very, very much viewed a, a, as a metaphor. Uh, the statement that you just made is religion coming in, uh, coming into scientific terrain. That is that it, that that that's not the idea. No, no, that doesn't get us anywhere. Um, There was this priest, astronomer, Georges Lemaitre, that I also write about. He was the one who in 1931 came up with the Big Bang. And then Albert Einstein complained. He told him like, look, Georges Lemaitre, this reminds me of Christian dogma. And then Lemaitre, being the priest, tried to explain to Einstein, no, 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 this Big Bang physics is going to be science like any other science. Um, it leaves out God. And Lemaitre, he had an idea of God as uh, what he would call a hidden God. So don't invoke God for any scientific concrete insight. Don't try to say what he or that implied but more sort of as a as a spiritual force i think and so i think he tried essentially beautifully to separate religion and science but yet leave space for both spheres of experience or for both spheres of thought i kind of like that vision yeah i would point out your your book also makes it clear how young cosmology as a science really is in terms of actually collecting data, right? Oh, I mean, like the... 1990s, not like centuries old, <laughs> right? So, I mean, a century from now, we may have a completely different understanding of this. So it's too soon to say, you know, that this is probably true or that's probably true. We're just pushing the envelope here. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is in full swing. Um, and then if you, if you think about what we were discussing, about gravitational wave observer observations or these ideas about holography. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, in 20 years, someone is going to have to, yeah, it's going to be, 
sort of a serious rethink. Let's hope, let's hope. That's science. That's what science is about, right? Uh, it's a whole discovery story and it continues one generation. <laughs> All right, Thomas, that's a good place to end. You can on the origin of time in twenty years you can write the second edition with the with the new discoveries. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Hawking's final theory, there it is, on the origin of time. Nicely done, beautifully written. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for coming on the show to talk to me about it. Thanks so much, Michael. <laughs>